Hello, welcome back. So, given the fact that I enjoyed doing the last video so much, uh, I decided to keep going with another lecture of Alan Watts. This time I'm gonna talk about one that I personally found very influential when I was younger. And it's called Jesus is Religion, uh, with a question mark. Um, this time the British philosopher attempts to explain a different approach towards Christianity and the figure of Jesus Christ and the vast implications that come with this. So first he explains where does the authority of the church uh, regarding the story of Jesus Christ comes from, which of course it's the Holy Bible. So he went there first. Um, for what the four original gospels were to be regarded as historical documents, or at least he, he played with that idea, meaning that they recollected truthful information about Jesus and his life. And this included the Gospel of St. John. Now, that particular gospel is important because people tend to, uh, tend to see that gospel as an, a, a later one, meaning that it was written around 125 AD for a lot of people because the level of knowledge and the level of, let's say, detail about the theological teachings of Christ were too advanced for the time. But the local caller and his knowledge about the topography of Jerusalem and his knowledge of the Jewish calendar was way more accurate than the other three Gospels. So, for what's it was easier to assume that it was not that that Gospel was later in 125 AD, but that John recorded the inner teachings, the esoteric ones, and that Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, wrote about the, let's say, the outer teaching, the exoteric ones that he gave to people at large. Now, what about the authority of the scriptures themselves? Uh, a big group of people actually don't know how we got the Bible. Uh, for a lot of them, the King James Version of the Bible is the original untouched version. And this, of course, it's not the case. Uh, the Bible has a way older origin. Uh, Westerners got the Bible from the Catholic Church. Uh, the Church and its members wrote the books of the New Testament and then took over the books of the Old Testament as well. Now. The books to be included in the New Testaments were not decided upon the year 382 in the Synod of Rome with uh, Pope Gemassus. And it was the Catholic Church that, let's say, edited and promulgated the Bible in itself. So, historically, we received the Bible on the Church's say-so, insisting that the Church, speaking under the presumed guidance of the Holy Spirit, uh, had the sole authority to interpret the Bible and people could take that or leave it. So, the authority of the Bible, of course, is not based on the Bible itself, because anyone can write uh, a Bible and say that it's the Word of God. Uh, Hindus believe that the Vedas are divinely revealed. Muslims think that the Quran uh, is divinely inspired. Uh, and the Japanese believe that the ancient texts of Shinto are of divine origin. And, and who can judge which one is true or not? So, if the church says the Bible is true, it finally comes to you and me. Uh, are we going to believe them or not? So, because if nobody believes the church, it will be perfectly clear that they have no authority. Because people are always the source of authority. An important thing to remember. Um, some people will say, no, God himself is the authority. But there's no evidence for that. Uh, so it remains until there is some evidence, simply an opinion. And there is nothing else to go on, except the opinion of other people that hold the same opinion as you, and whose opinion you actually bought. So it's just a loop. So what then moves to explain that he does agree that there is a sense in which the Bible is divinely inspired. Now, inspiration means something utterly different from dictation. Uh, dictation meaning, in this case, receiving a dictated message from an omniscient authority. Uh, inspiration comes very seldomly in words. And since inspiration always comes from a human vehicle, uh, it is liable to be distorted by the vehicle. And here Watts uses a, a perfect example to, to make his point. During his lecture, or like while I'm doing this, he was uh, talking through a microphone and a sound system. Now, if there's anything wrong, 
with the microphone or the sound system, whatever truths uh, that Watts was communicating through them would become distorted and people would have had mistaken them or mistaken the meaning of what he said. So the same thing happens with divinely inspired people. Uh, they will express their message within the limits of the language that they know. And by language, what's didn't mean just uh, like Hebrew, Hindu or English, uh, but also the terms and ideas that are available to the person, the type of religion, the type of culture, uh, the society, the concepts that were available to them and us and that, they, that we are brought up with. So if you were born in, within the Bible Belt, for example, and a version of Christianity was all you ever knew about spirituality. And then you had a mystical personal experience. And let's say the, the famous unity with existence. You felt that. And you, you would find yourself in the situation in which your language would only be able to express this as I am Jesus Christ. Because you have no other words to express that. And actually a lot of people say that. Uh, so what happens there? So people are trying to express uh, and explain their personal experience in terms of what they know within their own spiritual tradition, uh, in terms of the religious language, which is circumscribed in this case by the Bible. And of course, there's no other way this person can express that. But if that person had read the Upanishads, for example, uh, he and his culture would have had no problem or difficulty understanding what he was trying to say when he was saying, I'm Jesus. Because, for example, in the Upanishads, it is said that we are all incarnations of God. And the difference there is that when they say God, they don't mean this personal being that, well, not, not me personally, but like Western culture tends to think of. But it's an all-inclusive, supra-personal view of God. Um, and if you want to know more about that, you can check my previous video. Um, so for Hindus, we are all in the nature of God or how you would express it in Hebrew or in Arabic, a son of God, uh, a human that has realized uh, union with God. And this notion son of means in the nature of, in the same way that when you call somebody a son of a bitch, even a big kalp, it means son of a dog. A son of Belial, on the other side, it means an evil person. So, what's assumption then was that Jesus was a human being like Buddha or Sri Ramana Krishna or Ramana Maharshi that early in his life had a colossal experience of what he called cosmic consciousness, which is this overwhelming conviction that you have mistaken your identity. Uh, what you thought was just you is completely superficial. That I, uh, we used to talk about ourselves, is really an expression of something else, of something of an eternal something that can cannot be named and that this I suddenly understands why exactly why everything is the way that it is and it becomes perfectly clear and if you have a name that you can use in the background your psyche will say well this happening is God or it's the will of God is the flowing of the Tao or the dream of Brahman or uh, the Maya of the Brahman and so on so Let's suppose then that Jesus had such an experience, but Jesus has the limitation that he doesn't know any other religion than those in the immediate Near East. And therefore, if he would have come right out and say to everybody, I am the son of God, that would be saying, I am the boss's son, or I am the boss, which of course back then would have been blasphemy, even now would be blasphemy, because that would be trying to introduce democracy in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus in his exoteric teachings was pretty cagey about it. He didn't come out and say, I am, I am, I and the Father are one. Instead, he identified himself with the Messiah described by the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament. But to, to his elect disciples, his inner circle, as recorded by St. John, he came right out and said it uh, before Abram was, I am, uh, I am the truth, the way, and I am the resurrection and the life. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. I and the Father are one. And he who has seen me has seen the Father. And there can be no mistake in that language once you understand where, where he's coming from. So, the problem was that G Jewish people found out and uh, had him put to death because of blasphemy. So what happened? Uh, 
Well, the apostles didn't quite get the point. They worshipped him as people normally worship gurus. And Christians eventually said, okay, okay, so Jesus was the son of God, but nobody else. So what happened was that Jesus was pedestalized. He was put in a position that was safely upstairs from above from everybody else. So the, his troublesome cosmic experience would not cause other people to be a nuisance to the structure that was in place. But the problem is that if you pedestalize Jesus, uh, you strangle the gospel at birth. Now, gospel means good news. But the church's version is that we are supposed to just follow Jesus' life and example without having the unique advantage of being the boss's son, according to their own narrative. We are asked to follow the example of a perfect, mighty, powerful, miracle-creating, resurrecting, capable being uh, when we are just an imperfect, ordinary one. So we are delivered a gospel which is in fact an impossible religion. and. Because of that, we, we created a peculiar dynamic. Um, many Christians have said so and admitted it. Since it's impossible to be like the boss's son, you will always be aware of your own shortcomings. And the more shortcomings you feel, the more, you, in other words, you're aware between the best of us, between Christ and yourself, the better Christian you are. So what happened was that Christianity ended up having to institutionalize guilt as a virtue, which is super weird. Uh, and this is the Christianity of most people. Uh, it's what, what's called fundamentalist forms of Christianity and Protestantism. But then, what would be the real gospel then? That's the question what's put out there. What, uh, and for him, the real good news was not that only Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God, but that he was a powerful Son of God who came to open everybody else's eyes to the fact that we were all that. Uh, and this is made perfectly clear in the 10th chapter of St. John in verse 30, where Jesus says, I and the Father are one in front of a large group of people. And they pick up, immediately they pick up stones to try to stone him. And he asks, uh, many good works I have shown you from the Father, for which of these are you trying to stone me? And people answered, we're not trying to stone you because of your good work, but for blasphemy, because you being a man, try to make yourself a god. But then Jesus replied, isn't it written in your own law? I have said, this is God, I have said, you are gods. And it was like a boom moment. And he actually kept going and said, if, if God called those uh, who, he, who he gave his word to gods, and he's citing the 82nd Psalm here, uh, and you cannot deny the scriptures, Jesus said. How can you say I blaspheme? Because I say I'm a son of God. And of course, that's what there was a, let's say, a brilliant lawyering from the part of Jesus towards people. Because he was trying to explain that he was not saying it. He was not the first one saying it. And that it was not actually a, a blasphemy. Now, of course, in the King James Bible, uh, you will see italics in front of the word son of God. It will be the son of God because I have said I am the son of God. And most people think that those italics mean emphasis, but in this case they're not. They're, they indicate words interpolated mean interpreted by translators. You will not find that in the Greek version of the Bible. In the Greek one you actually find a son of God, not the son of God. So Jesus then has got it in his in the back of his mind that this is not something peculiar to or unique to himself. So when he says, I am the way, no man comes through the to the Father but by me, this I am, this me, is the divine in all of us. In Hebrew it would be called the Ruach Adonai. The Ruach is the divine in the creature, by virtue of which that creature, meaning us, our sons, are in the nature of God himself, manifestations of the divine. And this discovery is the gospel. This is the good news. But this has always been perpetually repressed throughout history by Western religion, because Western religions, especially Catholicism and Christianity, became forms of celestial hierarchical monarchies. Therefore, they have to discourage what could be called democracy in the kingdom of heaven. Um, that is the idea that we are all incarnations of the divine, that we are all equal. If then we see that 
Jesus speaks not from uh, the situation of a historical and unique, uh, weird, extraordinary event, but just a voice which joins with other voices which have said in every place and time, wake up and realize who you are. Then we can understand the message better. What said that the Bible was a very dangerous book and that to worship it was far more dangerous idolatry than uh, bowing down to images of wood and stone because nobody would confuse the wooden image, the idol, for the God itself. But you can very easily confuse the ideas with God himself, itself, because concepts are way more abstract. So an institution say about a religion or a spiritual path isn't necessarily accurate, truthful, or the same as the original message. Uh, it's our responsibility to always look uh, critically at whatever information comes our way. Uh, this is just a lecture that the British philosopher gave, but it doesn't mean that, at least let's say that I'm not trying to convince you, I'm just trying to make you entertain ideas. And for you to explore and research about them and the, what their meaning is. But for me, this was a, a deeply, let's say, transformational moment in my life when I started to realize that the way that I see myself is related deeply and fundamentally to the ideas that I have and that the way out of that is to actually start to understand where do they come from and what do they actually mean. Okay, that, that's it. Uh, I hope you had a, a good time seeing this and I'll be back. Thanks for watching and subscribe. <laughs> See you next time.